Good afternoon, Dr. Norton here with some Tarzan lectures. Uh, once again, wanting to be sensitive to the context that we're uh, working with here, the setting. Uh, and so I came outside here, figuring, you know, these trees, uh, much like the ones that Tarzan was swinging through in the text. Actually, these are eucalyptus trees from Australia. So if he tried to swing through these, they would definitely snap. But um, anyway, nonetheless, some jungle, some jungle background, and um, a very unnatural fountain, but a water feature nonetheless. So um, I'm trying. I'm just I'm trying to bring this to life for you all. Edgar Rice Burroughs, author of Tarzan, was an, uh, an American writer, best known, obviously, for this very work, Tarzan. And... Um, also for uh, the heroic Mars adventurer John Carter. Um, and, and at the same time, he, he created works in many different genres. He was born in September 1st, on September 1st, excuse me, 1875 in Chicago, Illinois. He died March 19th, 1950 in Encino, California. Some movies and TV shows that really he inspired and helped uh, create were John Carter, Tarzan, and more. He had three children, John Coleman, Joan Burroughs, and Holbert Burroughs. He was educated at Phillips Academy and Michigan Military Academy. Now, what, ta what Tarzan would be considered is part of the pulp fiction craze uh, that took place in the early 20th century. Uh, in the pulp fiction craze, this really was made up of a mass production of, of books through a development of the library system. This was kind of a, a big part of what, what, what Tarzan became a part of. In 1874, the library system was created in 1874, and this created a mass production of books. Paperback reproductions were um, sent books of all kinds into the hands of common, working-class men and women who would not have otherwise purchased expensive, hardbound copies. Pretty cool. The Pulp Fiction... The name Pulp Fiction is a magazine-like publication printed on cheap, pulpy paper. This is my copy of Tarzan of the Apes on cheap, pulpy paper, in which this, this copy here was all these pages, I believe, was only three bucks, and so uh, thus much cheaper than your typical hardback edition. Serials of stories were printed in these pulp publications. Shorter stories were printed in their entirety, while longer stories were carried over other issues uh, so through a series, as, you, as that word means, obviously, a series. I'll move this way, get out of the sun. So, um, uh, stories of high action and suspense were set in exotic locations. These appealed to a booming group of working class readers. Now, it was criticized for its proximity to commercialism. That's what Pulp Fiction was criticized for. Um, Pulp Fiction body of literature has made a lasting impression on contemporary entertainment. Although it's criticized for, for commercialism and all that kind of stuff, it has made a, a massive impact on contemporary entertainment. Many of the heroic characters from Pulp Fiction have been refashioned innumerable times in this century. Some elements of Pulp Fiction. Strong male protagonist. Always male. Male character is of an honorable character. He's trustworthy. He's honest. He's sexually pure. He's protective of female honor and purity. Um, what we normally have in Pulp Fiction is a beautiful hero and heroine. How many times, even in the, the first half that you're reading for this week, notice how many times the mention of his beauty, of Tarzan's beauty. How many mentions of that are there? So many. And what kind of beauty? The beauty of a classical nature. There's a beautiful hero, a beautiful heroine. Jane must be beautiful. That's, that's a key attribute. Because typically, beauty and honor, or external beauty and internal beauty, go together. It's kind of a classical attribute. Inner beauty and external beauty go together. Beautiful women in distress as a, a characteristic of Pulp Fiction, a beautiful woman in distress that is in need of help. And then, on the flip side of the beauty, you have an evil, evil ugly, morally base antagonist. 
The antagonists are always ugly. Um, one of the things you'll notice in the text, the cannibal tribe. He continues to call this group um, on the island the cannibal tribe. And, and there's not, it's not very, um, it's not racially sensitive, if you notice that or not. I, um, some of that obviously rubs me the wrong way. I'm sure it's rubbing you the wrong way, too. These, this cannibal tribe is, is seen as very base. Um, this is not a very racially or, yeah, racially sensitive text. This would be a colonialist viewpoint of race, which is an, another interesting kind of um, historical approach to the text. How would a colonially um, based text look? Just like this. The white man is superior. Even Tarzan, raised by apes, is superior in thought and in, in physique, mentally. He's superior to this cannibal race of, of black men and women um, who are cannibals and without any sense of moral um, vision, so they eat each other, right? Well, obviously this is more of a colonialist viewpoint. Uh, and, 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 and the cannibal tribe, although he sees them as, um, as men, and in some ways they are beautiful, I mean the description of them does come across as beautiful, at the same, in the same breath that he's talking about the beauty of the cannibal tribe, in a way, of their skin the being smooth and without hair, he also talks about how their teeth are filed down to a point, and, and other ways that this, this tribe is, is ugly. Um, and so they become part of the morally base antagonistic force in the text. The setting for a Pulp Fiction text is typically an exotic location with horrifying dangers, difficult obstacles of great size and extremity. The subject matter always involves victory for the protagonist. The victim is saved and evil is destroyed or conquered. So, right out the get-go, let's take a look at this. First page. I like how this story starts. Who is telling the story? I think that's a good question to ask. If anything you're reading, who is telling the story? Who is our narrator? What is the narrative um, structure? And so here we have this. I had this story from one who had no business to tell it to me, or to any other. I may credit the seductive influence of an old vintage upon the narrator for the beginning of it. Uh, be a wine, right? So he's drinking a lot, makes him talk. And my own skeptical incredulity during the days that followed for the balance of the strange tale. So the reason the guy told me was because he was somewhat drunk on an old vintage wine. Uh, secondly, though, my skeptical incredulity made me want to seek out the answers. Could this really be true? When my convivial host discovered that he had told me so much and that I was prone to doubtfulness, his foolish pride assumed the task the old vintage had commenced, and so he unearthed written evidence in the form of musty manuscript and dry official records of the British colonial office to support many of the salient features of his remarkable narrative. I do not say the story is true, for I did not witness the happenings which it portrays, but the fact that in the telling of it to you, I have taken fictitious names for the principal characters quite sufficiently evidences the sincerity of my own belief that it may be true. The yellow mildewed pages of the diary of a man long dead and the records of the colonial office dovetail perfectly with the narrative of my convivial host. And so I give you the story as I painstakingly pieced it out from these several various agencies. If you do not find it credible, you will at least be one with me in acknowledging that it is unique, remarkable, and interesting. <laughs> so, first few things. So, who is this, this narrator? This is a man in a bar who gets a story from a guy who's half-cocked, and yet, a man who, prodded by his own pride in seeing the incredulity and in seeing the doubtfulness in, the, in, the, in our narrator's face, like... Are you kidding me? Could this really be true? He's spurned on to produce manuscripts and produce official records from the British colonial office. All right, so we have a bit, bit of a, a historical account, but uh, at the same time, he's, he's apologizing for, for perhaps the, the lack of evidence that, that this thing really is true. In the least, he says, it's interesting. 
So is the narrator reliable or unreliable? Well, I mean, in some ways, he he argues for our he argues for our belief because of the work that he's done in putting this tale together. I've, I've done some research. I've looked into this thing to try to discover its its falsity, but so far I haven't been able to. Hey, I, I've found some pretty incredible records, and so in some ways, his doubtfulness of the story lends some belief to us, right? He's not saying, you got to believe this. He's saying, you know, this seems crazy to me, but I, I can't, I'm having a hard time denying its, its, uh, its truthfulness because of what I've found. So he kind of comes up beside us in a way. That's my next question here. What contributes to the reliability or unreliability of the narrator? And it's probably just those two things, right? How does the narrator's distance from the story affect the tone? Well, what is the tone? And we'd say there's a bit of mystery and intrigue, fantastical, yet perhaps possible. We join the narrator in the dark corner of the bar. This is what I think is cool about this. And this is what Rice, Edgar Rice Burroughs has set up. We join the narrator in the dark corner of the bar. In the tent, perhaps, with a flashlight. What else could be here? Around the campfire that after the day of hiking, right? We turn out the lights in the room. A long, long time ago, there lived an ape man named Tarzan. This does not have the same impact and the draw as the following. Psst, huddle in here, everybody. I heard the most incredible story the other day. A story involving some things you may not believe. Some things that are terrible and frightening. Some things that will shake the foundation of what you know to be true and real. I can't prove the story is true, but you've got to hear it. So what's attractive to the reader about this? Why does this kind of technique work? Because we're leaning in here, right? We're leaning in. <laughs> Burroughs employs the power of rumor and suspicion with a narrator who is himself fascinated and frightened by the tale. A narrator who may not be entirely reliable, but a narrator who bears an ancient jar, perhaps sealed by time, and he wants you to help him open it. Found this. What do you think's in it? How can you pass this up, right? That is the attraction of the tale itself. And Edgar Rice Burroughs, a genius, a genius in pulling the reader in. So is our reader, it's our narrator, excuse me, is our narrator omniscient, limited omniscient? The narration starts in the first person, but then switches to third person limited omniscience. We see this on page 27, actually. Um, so we see this here on page 27. It says, Short and grisly had been the work of the mutineers of the Fualda, and through it all John Clayton had stood leaning carelessly beside the companionway, puffing meditatively upon his pipe, as though he had been but watching an indifferent cricket match. At last, the last officer went down. He bethought him that it was time that he returned to his wife, lest some member, members of the crew find her alone below. Though outwardly calm and indifferent, Clayton was inwardly apprehensive and wrought up, for he feared for his wife's safety at the hands of these ignorant half-brutes, into whose hands fate had so remorselessly thrown them. As he turned to descend the ladder, he was surprised to see his wife standing on the steps almost at his side. How long have you been here, Alice? Since the beginning, she replied. How awful, John. See, we see this woman who's in distress. How awful, John. Oh, how awful. What can we hope for at the hands of such as those? And then John, in his, or Clayton, in his, John Clayton, in his daring, dashing, Pulp Fiction man voice says, Breakfast, I hope. <laughs> Breakfast, I hope. He answers, smiling bravely in, a, in, an attempt, in an attempt to allay her fears. All right, so here's our traditional classic Pulp Fiction hero, right? Yeah, Starling, fear not. What can we hope from these brutes? Well, nice breakfast, I suppose. And then she's, you know, this typical, kind of stereotypical Pulp Fiction heroine, uh, female... Oh, I don't know what to do. And so forth. 
she's wearing a very short skirt, perhaps, and her legs are out. You know, I, I don't know. This is kind of typical for Pulp Fiction, right? This heroine who's who's a bit sexy and and yet beautiful and modest, and yet crazy hot. You know, I mean, this is like the typical kind of. Uh, I do find it my my feminist sentiments are definitely um, uh, what's the word um, abused by this tale, and yet there is something very valuable in this from a historical standpoint, and even just a writing technique. Uh, there's a lot in this that's very influential, and so thus I feel like it's very, very much worth reading and worth studying. Um, so there's very much a conversation like, hey you, do you want to hear a story? It goes like this, there was a man and wife. Uh, what effect does the third person limited omniscience have on the reader in the first two chapters during the conflict on the full wall? That, well, what would change about the story if we knew what everyone was thinking? This technique raises the level of tension, right? We do not know that Black Michael is a man of his word, thus we are kept in the dark. We do not know that the men will obey Black Michael. We know for certain that John Clayton is very nervous in spite of his cool demeanor. We know more about John than his frail little wife Alice knows about him. Some dramatic irony there. When we know something that the characters don't know. We call that dramatic irony. So another question that's raised here is what is honor? What does it mean to have honor? Is honor a natural human attribute? Why do we respect people with honor? Do all people have honor? Or is it only the most well-bred? Is honor in more abundance in those who are of a higher social standing? It seems that the text would tell us so. There is definitely something of a survival of the fittest mentality in this text that I want you to be looking for. Survival of the fittest. And you know, those who rise into power are often some of the most advanced mentally, physically, uh, emotionally perhaps. That, that is something what is said in the text. That's not my own belief, but that's definitely something that's being said in the text. Is there such a thing as a noble savage? Well, in some ways it depends on what kind of blood is running through her veins or his veins. If it's noble blood, if it's royal blood, it, of course, this, this character will be noble, will have a more noble sentiment, will have uh, more potential for nobility and greatness. What does the narrator believe about the character of John Clayton and Alice Clayton? How are his feelings revealed? Well, in many ways we see that on page 16 with John Clayton. It says, Clayton was the type of Englishman that one likes best to associate with the noblest monuments of historic achievement upon a thousand victorious battlefields. A strong, virile man, mentally, morally, and physically. In stature, he was above the average height. Of course he was, because he has noble blood. His eyes were gray, his features regular and strong, his carriage that of a perfect, robust health, influenced by his years of army training. I just read the one about the pipe on page 27. This is his character, noble and calm under pressure, definitely not wanting to give any reason for his wife to fear. On page 32... He says this. There is but one thing to do, Alice. And he spoke as quietly as though they were sitting in their snug living room at home. And that is work. Work must be our salvation. How's this going to be? There we go. Work must be our salvation, he says. My dog is trying to get over here and mess things up a bit. Here she comes. Here she comes, the beast. Check this out. Oh, stealthy beast. Like a black panther in the night. All right, let me move here. Sorry, I probably should turn this off, but let's just go. Slide over. Set us up. There we go. There's too much air around here. It's the back of my house. There you go. Let me show you this. This is kind of cool, actually. Check this out. Out in the wild. Here she comes. Uh-oh, she's creeping up. Oh, 
the leopard. Sheeta is the leopard, right? I think this looks a little bit like Sheeta. Minus 350 pounds, perhaps, and some serious claws. That might be Sheeta. You might have been Sheeta if you weren't a little bit more evolved, buddy. No offense. All right, let's do this. Sorry, guys. I'm going to pull this guy out. Set him up here. Okay, there we go. Okay, gotta get out of the sun a little bit. Can't afford that. There's but one thing to do, Alice, he says. Work. Work must be our salvation. We must not give ourselves time to think, for in that direction lies madness. We must work and wait. I am sure that relief will come and come quickly. When once it is apparent that the Fowalda has been lost, even though Black Michael does not keep his word to us. But John, if it were only you and I, we could endure it, I know, but... Yes, dear, he answered gently. I have been thinking of that also. She probably points at her stomach right because she's pregnant. But we must face it. As we must face whatever comes, bravely, and with the utmost confidence in our ability to cope with circumstances, whatever they may be. And then this one. I like this part here, too. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, our ancestors of the dim and distant past faced the same problems which we face possibly in these same primeval forests that we are here today evidences their victory. There's a bit of evolution there, right? Passing down. Don't go away. What they did, may we not do? And even better, for we, for are we not armed with ages of superior knowledge? And have we not the means of protection, defense, and sustenance which science has given us? but of which they were totally ignorant. Technology, technological advances will help us survive. What they accomplished, Alice, with instruments and weapons of stone and bone, surely that may we accomplish also. Ah, oh, John, says Alice, I wish that I might be a man with a man's philosophy. <laughs> but I am but a woman, seeing with my heart rather than my head. And all that I can see is too horrible, too unthinkable to put into words. I only hope you are right, John. I will do my best to be a brave, primeval woman. A fit mate for the primeval man. I love it. Uh, this is so telling of the time period, right? So telling of the time period. So telling of this genre of pulp fiction. Building right into these stereotypes and the views of man and woman, or men and women of the day. You know what's interesting is what you see in Shakespeare, for instance. Not really in The Tempest, because The Tempest is pretty much male dominant, isn't it? I mean, you have Prospero and a bunch of men, and you have Miranda, who um, probably would fit nicely into a Pulp Fiction text, I think, because Miranda is just, is just so Eve-like. You know, I mean, she's so innocent, hasn't ever seen anyone else. But that's not really typical of Shakespeare's women, to be honest with you. If you've read Romeo and Juliet, for instance, Juliet is, is ten times smarter than Romeo. She even calls him out about a dozen times saying, stop being an idiot. And she doesn't say the word idiot, but she basically says, stop romanticizing. I love you. You love me. Let's make this work. I mean, she's like tough. King Lear, another instance of a, of a strong woman, Cordelia. Cordelia is the daughter of King Lear. And she saves his butt. I mean, she goes and she saves him. She rallies together an entire army of French soldiers. And comes back to England and she saves her own father, who's turned into this inept pile of mush. Her father, who's this overly emotional sap, a whining baby. That's what he turns out to be. And he's a king, of all things. And so, in some ways, Shakespeare is far more advanced in his view of women. Um, is far more controversial in his portrayal of strong, thoughtful, thinking, courageous women than what we see in a text like this. Now again, I think this is a great book for a lot of things. Um, does it have a very true um, and lasting view of what, 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 what femininity is or what a woman is? No, not at all. Does it have a perfect depiction of women in the early 20th, late 19th century? Absolutely. Does it does it show the mind of the colonialists of the late 19th, early 20th century um, people? Absolutely. Is it a beautiful and incredibly accurate picture of, 
of where the American psyche was in the early 20th century? Yes. Late 19th century? Yes. Um, and so thus, uh, a great study. And it doesn't have great action and, and, and well-created characters. I think in a lot of ways that the action is incredible and it's, it's very um, creative uh, in so many interesting ways. Um, so on we go. Thirty-five, page thirty-five. Himself brave and fearless, yet was he able to appreciate the awful suffering which fear entails, a rare gift, though but one of many which had made the young Lord Greystoke respected and loved by all who knew him. So here we have an empathetic lover. We have a quintessential Englishman, a physical specimen, a perfect build, a soldier in the army. He's calm under, excuse me, he's calm under pressure, smoking his pipe, like a noble philosopher. He's a philosopher teacher, telling Alice, hundreds of thousands of years ago, Alice, our ancestors survived. Empathetic lover, uh, on page 42, we see him, perhaps, as a romantic figure. At other times, Clayton wrote in his diary, which he had always been accustomed to keep in French. Why not? And in which he recorded the details of their strange life. This book he kept locked in a little metal box. A year from the day her little son was born, Lady Alice passed quietly away in the night. So peaceful was her end that it was hours before Clayton could awake to the realization that his wife was dead. The horror of the situation came to him very slowly and it is doubtful that he ever fully realized the enormity of his sorrow and the fearful responsibility that had devolved upon him with the care of that wee thing, the little baby, right? His son, still a nursing babe. The last entry in his diary was made the morning following her death, and there he recites the sad details in a matter-of-fact way that adds to the pathos of it, for it breathes a tired apathy born of long sorrow and hopelessness, which even this cruel blow could scarcely awake to further suffering. He writes in French, My little son is crying for nourishment. Oh, Alice, Alice, what shall I do? Great pathos here. And as John Clayton wrote the last words his hand was destined ever to pen, he dropped his head wearily upon his outstretched arms, where they rested upon the table he had built for her who lay still and cold, in the bed beside him. For a long time, no sound broke the death-like stillness of the jungle midday, save the piteous wailing of the tiny man-child. So. so he's a romantic figure, journaling in French, a philosopher, one who will think his way through the dangers. Um, even Alice Clayton, you know, on 31, we saw a bit of her. As the Fawalda passed through the narrow entrance, top of 32, to the harbor and out of sight behind a projecting point, Lady Alice threw her arms about Clayton's neck and burst into uncontrollable sobs. Bravely had she faced the dangers of the mutiny with heroic fortitude. She had looked into the terrible future, but now that the horror, horror of absolute solitude was upon them, her overwrought nerves gave way, and the reaction came. He did not attempt to check her tears. It were better that nature have her way in relieving these long, pent emotions. And it was many minutes before the girl, little more than a child she was, could again gain mastery of herself. She's brave, yet quite emotional and dependent on her man. Page 40. These, these really cool pictures of, of historic femininity or an historic view of women, I think, are, are great. Um, Lady Greystoke, on page 40, Lady Greystoke never recovered from the shock of the great ape's attack. And though she lived for a year after her baby was born, she was never again outside the cabin, nor did she ever fully realize that she was not in England. Sometimes she would question Clayton as to the strange noises of the night, the absence of servants and friends, and the strange rudeness of the furnishings within her room. But though he made no effort to deceive her, never could she grasp the meaning of it all. In other ways, 
She was quite rational, and the joy and happiness she took in the possession of her little son and the constant attentions of her husband made that year a very happy one for her, the happiest of her young life. That, would, that it would have been beset by worries and apprehensions had she been in full command of her mental faculties, Clayton knew well. What is that saying about her? So that while he suffered terribly to see her so, there were times when he was almost glad for her sake that she could not understand. She lacks the mental strength of a man, of course. She, if she were in her full faculties, would be overwhelmed by the dangers, the worries, the apprehensions that were all around her, and she would not be able to handle this. Again, an uh, interesting portrayal, a very vivid portrayal of early 20th century women. Not, not in reality, but the perceptions of an early 20th century woman. slide down here in my notes. A theme to consider. When stripped of the trappings of culture and society, when naked and alone, what is a man made of? What can a woman accomplish in this situation? We have modern man versus primeval man. Man against nature. What is a noble savage? Has modern society weakened man's senses? Has it led to the deterioration of his natural glory? In some ways, as we see early on here, John Clayton versus his own son, Tarzan. We see modern man versus primeval man, right? Modern man, John Clayton. Primeval man, although he is in modern, modern years, he's in a part of modern, uh, the modern era, He's not a part of modern society, and so thus he grows up as a primeval man would have grown up. In these two characters, we have uh, the dichotomy. Modern man, John Clayton, versus primeval man, Tarzan. Look how quickly John Clayton, although he makes a valiant effort at it, how quickly he is killed. He's destroyed by, by nature, by um, the jungle itself. And then look at Tarzan, his son, who climbs to great feats, of strength and dominates his surroundings, dominates the society in which he finds himself. What is this saying about modern society? Modern society has clearly weakened John Clayton. John Clayton is not the man that he probably, his ancestors once were, being able to conquer um, the jungle and these great beasts. In some ways, modern society, in, its, all its, in all of its extravagances and in all of its comforts, has weakened um, the modern man. Interesting theme that we see in this text. Well, page 43. I think it's an interesting shift here on page 43. It goes like this. <clears throat> this is chapter 4, The Apes. In the forest of the Table Land, a mile back from the ocean, old Kerchak the Ape was on a rampage of rage among his people. The younger and lighter members of his tribe scampered to the higher branches of the great trees to escape his wrath, risking their lives upon branches that scarce supported their weight. Rather than face old Kerchak in one of his fits of uncontrolled anger. So we have a narrative change, or a narration change, um, with the introduction of a second plot line. On 43, we get knowledge of the deep jungle society. On page 45, we get knowledge of Kerchak's thoughts. We learn his fears. We learn that he fears Tantor the elephant on page 45. Bottom of 45, it was shortly after noon when they reached a ridge overlooking the beach where below them lay the tiny cottage, which was Kerchak's goal. He had seen many of his kind go to their deaths before the loud noise made by the little black stick. Ironic, right? Why is that dramatic irony? The loud noise made by the little black stick? Because we know that the loud noise made by the little black stick is the rifle, right? And so this is considered dramatic irony. When we know something, the characters in the text do not know. Little black stick in the hands of the strange white ape, another bit, who lived in that wonderful lair. And Kerchak had made up his brute mind to own that death-dealing contrivance. 
and to explore the interior of the mysterious den. He wanted very, very much to feel his teeth sink into the neck of the queer animal that he had learned to hate and fear. And because of this, he came often with his tribe to reconnoiter, waiting for a time when that white ape should be off his guard. Pretty cool. I didn't see Tantor the elephant there, but I think that's a little farther down. We do know that he fears the white ape. That's what we learn through the omniscient narrative that switches to an omniscient narrative here. The narrator takes on omniscient knowledge of the thoughts and feelings of the giant apes. The narrator is describing events outside the knowledge and vision of John Clayton, which he originally limited himself to in the first couple chapters. How does this change the story's atmosphere? Perhaps we can better empathize empathize with the animals the narrator has thus far painted as enemies, right? That is part of the purpose of the narrative shift, to turn our empathy toward the animals, to speak from their perspective. In what ways does the, this omniscient knowledge add to the complexity of the story? Well, just that, right? Complexity is added to the story through the introduction of the omniscient narrative style or the omniscient narrative structure because by going omniscient, all of a sudden we are in the minds of these animals, thus making them much more difficult to hate, much more difficult to see as simply one-dimensional antagonistic forces, right? With knowledge comes empathy. The story is no longer just man against beast. Now, I have a story for you. Years ago, I... Uh, before I was married, I, I lived in a, an area of Dana Point that was um, it was part of a Latino community. I moved into this community that was, was largely lat Latino, and I am not Latino, um, nor do I speak much Spanish. Um, but it was a great neighborhood. It was a cool neighborhood. I had a big dog. It was a big Rottweiler, and this is the one space that had a, a yard big enough for my dog, and so I took it. And the first few days I was there, I was kind of nervous. I mean, a lot of the you know, whether it be Mexican or um, the Latino folks that were in the community there would be out in their driveways and they were speaking a language I didn't understand and they were making observations in my direction and when I would walk out with my dog, I didn't know what they were saying. Were they telling stories about me? Were they um, planning to, to uh, mug me or something? You know, I'm, basically what my point is, is after a few days, I got to know some of these guys and they were wonderful people, as I should have known they would be. But my point is, where ignorance is, and I was ignorant of these people and ignorant of the culture. Really, I've never lived in a different culture in a sense, what it kind of turned out to be. I never lived there. With ignorance comes fear. With knowledge comes understanding and empathy. And gosh, I learned that uh, the folks, at least in this community, were, were great family men and great family women. And they loved to, to open up their garages and have they had couches in their garages. And they'd have every afternoon, they'd have have beer out there or drinks and just talking and playing games. It was amazing. But before I had knowledge, when there was ignorance, there was fear. And you know, fear creates prejudice. Fear creates racism. If you ever talk to somebody who is really racist, usually a lot of the terminology that they, they, they throw at you is fear-based, um, ironically. So anyway, we have that same kind of shift in the text here, which I think is fascinating. All of a sudden, we understand the minds of these apes. We are in their mind. We hear from Kerchak that he is motivated by fear and, and danger. I mean, there's a danger. This, this white ape has a, an explosive stick. Of course he's going to try to kill him. Why wouldn't he? I would. If I thought that there was some strange creature out in my yard that might kill my children, I would go and try to to destroy that, or at least eradicate the danger. That's what we see. So, in a very interesting way, I think Burroughs kind of is, is talking about prejudices, racism, um, in some fascinating ways. I think they kind of go beyond just the, the plot line itself, which I think is pretty cool. So the story becomes no longer just about man against beast. Um, on page 44, bottom of page 44 it says Kala was the youngest wife of a male called Tublat meaning broken nose and the child she had seen dashed to death was her first for she was but nine or ten years old 
Notwithstanding her youth, she was large and powerful, a splendid, clean-limbed animal, with a round, high forehead, which denoted more intelligence than most of her kind possessed. So also, she had a greater capacity for mother love and mother sorrow. Interesting. Kala becomes more than a giant ape. She is an emotional mother, showing true signs of sorrow at the loss of her baby. On page 47, high up among the branches of a mighty tree, she hugged the shrieking infant to her bosom, and soon the instinct that was as dominant in this fierce female as it had been in the breast of his tender and beautiful mother, Alice, the instinct of mother love reached out to the tiny man-child's half-formed understanding, and he became quiet. Then hunger closed the gap between them, and the son of an English lord and an English lady nursed at the breast of Kala, the giant ape. That's awesome. Um, so Burroughs is, is all about class distinctions. I mean, in some ways, uh, in modernism, we see a destruction of class. Everybody goes to the bathroom. Everybody, you know, passes gas. Everybody is is kind of degraded in their own way, which is true. But sometimes we see in modernism is, to use a cliche, is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Is there something significant about class? Is there something significant about authority, authority structures or structures of authority? And we see this in Shakespeare as well and many other great writers. We see them take on this question, what is the nature of authority? What is the nature of class and class distinction? Is it there for a reason? Should it be thought through or just thrown out as, oh man, these people, you know, they're, they're, um, they're caught up in their hierarchies. They just want to dominate the, the, the poor species. Is that all that it is? Or is there a purpose and a, and a need for government and leadership? Is there a place for class distinction? I don't know. That's definitely something that he works with here. That he makes this point that an English lord, the son of an English lord, an English lady, would nurse at the breast of an ape. <gasps> Atrocious. How could it be? No, 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 don't do it. You know, you can just hear the crowd. No, no, no way. You know, Queen Elizabeth herself as a child nursing at, as an ape, nursing on an ape. Um, so what does this mean? Um, I think, again, Burroughs working with ideas of status in society, of roles, of authority. But also, it shows this ape. From the omniscient narrative, we see an ape as a real mother. We see an ape elevated in many ways, as he says, to the place of a great mother. On page 49, those of the apes who attempted to examine Kala's strange baby were repulsed with bared fangs and low, menacing growls, accompanied by words of warning from Kala. When they assured her that they meant the child no harm, she permitted them to come close, but would not allow them to touch her charge. It was as though she knew that her baby was frail and delicate, and feared lest the rough hands of her fellows might injure the little thing. Another thing she did, and which made traveling an onerous trial for her. Remembering the death of her own little one, she clung desperately to the new babe with one hand whenever they were upon the march. The other young rode upon their mother's backs, their little arms tightly clasping the hairy necks before them, while their legs were locked beneath their mother's armpits. Not so with Kala. Ironic here, obviously. I have a, as you've seen my baby, I have a little baby. An infant cannot hold on. An infant human cannot hold on like an infant ape, right? Well, it just so happens, ironically, yeah, that, yeah, because it's not what you'd expect, so it would be considered irony, right? The irony is that because she has lost a baby, she's going to hold on to this one more. Ironically, it's because, well, that's another wild beast in the jungle barking over there. Yo, it's a good thing we came out here. It's craziness. But it's good, apropos for the Tarzan lecture. So, the irony is that this baby wouldn't be able to hold on anyway. So it just so happens that the mother has is a traumatized mother, mother traumatized with having dropped her baby so she's not going to let that happen again and so thus she holds on to baby Tarzan as she would as any um, human would have to hold on to their baby right? not so with Kala 
she held the small form of little great Lord Greystoke tightly to her breast, where the dainty hands clutched the long black hair which covered the portion of her body. She had seen one child fall from her back to a terrible death, and she would take no further chances with this. So, I mentioned this before, but my question here, this, this, this shift in narration contributes to a strong sense of irony. The narrator communicates in the language of the beasts. The stick, the black stick is the gun. The white ape is Clayton. Um, this white ape is, is Tarzan. Uh, this is dramatic irony. Um, we see the, the rifle discovery on page 47 to 49. Um, there's a certain mood of excitement and suspense when Kerchak picks up that rifle and then discharges it. And they all run. Right? There's a sense of irony, um, but the narrative shift adds to that sense of irony for us. Um, I think this is a good one too. The, the juxtaposition, the juxtap when you juxtapose something, right? You, two things, so an empty hand and a hand with a book. These are being juxtaposed. What's the difference? Well, it's obvious, right? This one has a book, this one doesn't. Um, this one is, is light, this one is heavy, whatever. When you juxtapose two things, you place them next to each other, right? So the juxtaposition of the human baby and the ape baby build into the novel's developing themes. What are we able to see when the human baby and the ape baby are compared? We're able to see the human race in tension with the animal kingdom, right? With the larger animal kingdom. And on page 51, it says, this is the beginning of chapter 5. Ta uh, tenderly Kala nursed her little waif, wondering silently why it did not gain strength and agility, as did the little apes of other mothers. It was nearly a year from the time the little fellow came into her possession before he would walk alone. And as for climbing, my, but how stupid he was. Kala sometimes talked with the other females about her young hopeful, but none of them could understand how a child could be so slow and backward in learning to care for itself. Why? It could not even find food alone, and more than twelve moons had passed since Kala had come upon it. Had they known that the child had seen thirteen moons before it had come into Kala's possession, they would have considered its case absolutely hopeless, for the little apes of their own tribe were as far advanced in two or three moons as was this little stranger after twenty-five. Slow development. All right, so we see this, this theme developing in the story through the baby's comparison, the juxtaposing of the, of the two kinds of babies. Ape babies, human babies. Slow development of the human baby as, de as opposed to the quick development of the ape baby. Um, on page 52, though, we see, as Tarzan grew, he made more rapid strides so that by the time he was 10 years old, he was an excellent climber, and on the ground he could do many wonderful things, which were beyond the powers of his little brothers and sisters. In many ways, he did differ from them, and they often marveled at his, what? At his superior cunning. But in strength and size, he was deficient. For at ten, the great anthropoids were fully grown, some of them towering at six feet in height, while little Tarzan was but still a half-grown boy. Yet... Such a boy, says Burroughs. So he has superior cunning, right? So as a child, he's developing mentally, whereas the apes are not at 10 years. Um, as a 10-year-old human, he's slow developing physically, and yet the apes fully develop anthropoids, over six, six feet tall and muscular, strapping. 54, we see his ability to make quick decisions, again, that separates himself from the beasts. On 58, um, we see Burroughs talk about how humans are suffused or infused with divine power because they are made in the image of God, which is interesting. Interesting, again, an in interesting um, portrayal of 20th, early 20th century's views of humankind. Um, although I believe that humans are made in the image of God, you don't see that in much modernism or postmodern literature. In Tarzan's clever little mind, many thoughts revolved, and back of these was his divine power of reason. Again, the juxtaposition, right, between ape and human. Strong ancestry 
aids Tarzan. We see that in several different places. But on page 62, we see, had Tarzan been a full-grown bull ape of the species of his tribe, he had been more than a match for the gorilla. But being only a little English boy, though enormously muscular for such, he stood no show against his cruel antagonist. And here it is. In his veins, though, flowed the blood of the best of a race of mighty fighters. And back of this was the training of his short lifetime among the fierce brutes of the jungle. It's one thing that he's human, and that's going to also that's going to allow him uh, more advanced cunning, more better mental skills than his the um, his brother beast, the apes. Um, he's going to develop his mind. He's going to have rational thought processes, right? That the apes will lack because he's human. But Edgar Rice Burroughs takes it a step further here by saying, not only is he human, but he has the blood of the best kind of humans. And because of this, he will rise to even greater heights. In his veins flowed the blood of the best of a race of mighty fighters. So again, you see some of that idea of the survival of the fittest, some Darwinian ideas that are kind of leaking into Burroughs' text. Uh, it's, I don't know. If, if he was the son of a lowly English professor, like yours truly, uh, perhaps he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to do quite as well. But because he has the blood of the best of a race of mighty fighters, well, good thing. Because otherwise, he'd be trying to teach them Shakespeare and that wouldn't work and he'd be killed. He'd be ape food pretty quick. Um, so here again, um, uh, you know, I, my notes just jotted down. Well, I, yeah, I, jot, I made this note here. Um, we see strong ancestry aids him, and then here on page 64, we see another part of the juxtaposition of ape and human. This is kind of the same thing I'm building upon here, the same point. Um, page 64, with a low cry, Kala rushed to Tarzan's side and gathering the poor blood-covered body to her breast, listened for a sign of life. Faintly she heard it, the weak beating of the little heart. Tenderly she bore him back through the inky jungle to where the tribe lay. And for many days and nights she sat guard beside him, bringing him food and water, brushing the flies and other insects from his cruel wounds. Of medicine and surgery, the poor thing knew nothing. She could but lick the wounds, and thus she kept them cleansed, that healing nature might the more quickly do her work. At first Tarzan would eat nothing, but rolled and tossed in a wild delirium of fever. All he craved was water, and this she brought him in the only way she could, bearing it in her own mouth. No human mother, here we go, no human mother could have shown more unselfish and sacrificing devotion than did this poor, wild brute for the little orphaned waif whom fate had thrown into her keeping. So the Kala's mothering, Kala's mothering of Tarzan, rivaling that of any human mother. Again, that, that with the juxtaposing, juxtaposition excuse me, of, the, of the human beast and the ape, or the human child and the ape child, um, we see the mothering even come out as being a part of the juxtapositioning, and we see Kala having all the same loving instincts that a human mother would have. All right, an interesting kind of complexity to add to the themes of this text. Well, there's other things in this text I think that we would we would add. Um, I don't want to go into this too much because this is getting a bit long. We're already at 54 minutes. Wow. Um, but here's a couple questions. In what ways does the narrator seem critical of humanity? Um, do you find yourself torn between your love and appreciation for jungle society and human society? Uh, we see on page 95 and 96, only humans kill for pleasure. On page 91, we see mirroring of Lord Greystoke. What is, civiliz what is civilized society that lacking that Tarzan possesses? Let me say that again. On page 91, we see, we begin to see a mirroring. And that sounds like a truck, but I'm pretty sure that was a great lion roaring out in the woods over here. Um, 
on page 91, we see a mirroring of Lord Greystoke back in England, a mirroring there with Tarzan. And we see that throughout this text, right? At the same moment, Burroughs writes, well, let's just go there real quick, page 91. But be that as it may, Tarzan would not ruin good meat in any such foolish manner, so he gobbled down a great quantity of the raw flesh, burying the balance of the carcass beside the trail, where he could find it upon his return. Um, and then Lord Greystoke wiped his greasy fingers upon his naked thighs. This is Lord Greystoke back in England. He wiped his greasy fingers upon... No, no, sorry, sorry. This is Tarzan, right? And then Lord Greystoke, Tarzan, wiped his greasy fingers upon his naked thighs and took up the trail of Kulonga, the son of Mbonga, the king. While in far-off London, here we go, another Lord Greystoke, the younger brother of the real Lord Greystoke's father, sent back his chops to the club's chef because they were underdone, and when he had finished his repast, he dipped his finger ends into a silver bowl of scented water and dried them upon a piece of snowy damask. So, what's going on here? Obviously, a, a criticism of, of, of modern man, of contemporary society, um, in its uh, kind of gross refinement that... Uh, a gross refinement is a, is a paradox, I suppose, but in its, in its refinement that seems ludicrous and absurd, for what purpose are we living to, to live in this way of such uh, refined sentiments that we've lost so much of what it is to really survive and, and live fully? On page 108, the voices of Tarzan and his mirror in human society, we have strength and power not connected with nature lacking power. It's on page 108. Again, another critique. It says, And in London, another Lord Greystoke was speaking to his kind in the Lord in the House of Lords, but none trembled at the sound of his soft voice. So even his voice, his, his ability to be authoritative and a true leader of, of people and beasts is lost because of, of, the, of, of the comforts and the extravagances of contemporary society. Just before this, what happens? Tarzan, it says, the first echoed 